Good evening and welcome to the Shrewsbury Historical Society meeting. This is our March 2020, 2022 presentation. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm the treasurer, Jeffrey Undercoupler. Tonight we have a wonderful program. Before we begin, let's have a brief uh, moment of silence and, and for a longtime member, Annette Davis. Thank you. The executive board will be meeting later this month, so we will update you with the curator's report and the treasury report in April. Tonight, the Shrewsbury Historical Society presents It's My Seat by John Horrigan, virtual program and tape broadcast on the Shrewsbury channels 28 and 328 and available on demand online at www.shrewsbury mediaconnection.org. About the program tonight, award-winning historian John Horrigan presents It's My Seat, a 100-year chronology that begins with Elizabeth Jennings and concludes with Rosa Parks. It is the story of women who refused to give up their seats, which sparks the landmark court cases that ended segregation and the establishment of civil rights for African Americans. About the presenter, John Horrigan is a pro prolific historical researcher and author. He lectures, his lecture portfolio includes over 100 different titles. He has presented lectures at historical societies and other prominent venues throughout New England over the past 20 years. Thank you so much, and uh, I'm going to turn the program over to John. Great to be back um, uh, to all of the ailing members of the Shrewsbury Historical Society. Get well soon. My name is John Horgan. This is It's My Seat. And uh, it, this is a, if you want to see my two hour special, one where I go over virtually every single woman that had to give up her seat over a hundred year period, you can just Google it on YouTube. It's My Seat. It's a two hour special. But as Jeff mentioned, I've, uh, I've been lucky enough to win five Boston New England Emmy Awards as host of The Folklorist. You can find it at www.folklorist.tv. Now, discretion is strongly advised. Uh, I'm going to be using two outdated terms that were predominant in historical records, and they may be offensive to you. It's not the nasty, violent, vile word, but uh, pause now so you have time to stop viewing this presentation and safely move away, because I may use two words that were used in the vernacular of the 1950s. So I'm just going to pause, and you may want to watch something else. Good. We can go on. So these two terms are Negro and colored people. They're antiquated. They shouldn't be used, but they are used in historical records. Now, they show up in transcripts that um, I'm not going to be reviewing Browder versus Gale, but if you get a chance, look at the transcript of Browder versus Gale, and you'll see uh, the resilience of really a Browder, Mary Louise Smith and uh, Claudette Colvin, how classy and dignified they were despite the uh, questioning by a really racist uh, district attorney in middle Alabama. But anyway, so uh, this acronym, the NAACP, National Advancement for the Association for uh, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. So I'm going to try to use African American wherever I can in place with these terms. Good. So if I use the term black, blacks, or black people, I do not mean to use them in a derogatory sense. Nor do I mean to offend people when I use the term colored people or people of color that are prevalent in historical documents and reports from the period. In the words of my words, not the words of Shrewsbury Historical Society or Shrewsbury Media. If, if you have an issue with anything I say, you can reach out to me directly. So this is a chronology of the struggle for civil rights endured by selective African-American women. We're going to talk about two, Elizabeth Jennings and Rosa Parks. And it's a focus on the events that led up to the Montgomery bus boycott of 1955. These women took a stand for equal rights by remaining seated. Now there were and still are millions of acts of discrimination that have been and still are committed against African American males as well as African American females. The enforced segregation events that took place in Montgomery, Alabama during 1955 are just a microcosm of the hostilities that African Americans have had to endure for over 400 years. 
My sources are various, numerous, but I did go to biography.com, history.com, blackpast.org, nationalhumanitycenter.org, wikipedia, civilhumanrights.org, the New York Times, Smithsonian, Washington Post, and various other periodicals of the period. <clears throat> Now, if you look at all the women um, that had to give up their seat, and these are the people that actually, there are historical accounts, there are probably 10 times more women, 100 times more women than these that were offended uh, by Jim Crow laws and racial segregation. But aside from Elizabeth Jennings, there was Ellen Anderson, Ida B. Wells, Irene Morgan, Sarah Keyes, Mary Fair Burks, Joanne Robinson, we'll talk about her tonight, Georgia Gilmore, who was a fantastic cook. Martin Luther King used to go down to Montgomery and make a beeline to her house. There would be a line out in front. She was such a great chef, such a good cook. Aurelia Browder, we'll touch on her momentarily. Claudia Colvin, as I mentioned. Mary Louise Smith. Rosa Parks. And then uh, we'll talk briefly about the Emancipation Proclamation, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. The New York Draft Riots, we'll look at that of 1863. The Fables of Reconstruction, the Compromise of 1877. Then some other courses, uh, landmark court cases uh, that actually broke down the walls of segregation. They were Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896, Brown versus the Board of Education, 1954, and of course, Browder versus Gale, 1956. So Elizabeth Jennings Graham, in, in my old show, The Folklorist, you can see a video we did. It's one of my proudest pieces. The acting was sensational. But you could go to the YouTube, Google The Folklorist Elizabeth Jennings, and you'll see the video. She was born in March of 1827, died on June 5, 1901. She was an African-American teacher and civil rights figure. And in 1854, 100 years before Rosa Parks, she insisted on her right to ride on an available New York City streetcar at a time when all such companies were private and most operated segregated streetcars. And her case was decided in her favor in 1855, and it led to the eventual, eventual desegregation of all New York City transit systems by 1865. It took a, a, a 90 years later for Montgomery to, to get the word. But Elizabeth was born free in March 1827. Her parents were Thomas L. Jennings on the right and his wife, who was also named Elizabeth, and we know that they had at least five children. So Thomas, Elizabeth's father, was born free. Elizabeth's mo mother, also named Elizabeth, was born into slavery. And Thomas Je Jennings became a successful tailor and an influential member of New York's black community, being the first known African-American to hold a patent in the history of the United States. In 1821, he was awarded a patent from the U.S. government for developing dry scouring, a new method to clean clothing. This guy invented dry cleaning. And with the fees from his patented dry cleaning process, Thomas Jennings bought his wife's freedom as she was still considered an indentured servant until 1827 under the state's gradual abolition law of 1799. And their daughter Elizabeth was thus born free and she received an education. That's a picture of Elizabeth right there, by the way, in the center. And to give you an idea of New York City streets at this time in the mid-19th century, you can see it on the right there. So Elizabeth, the daughter, later would start the city's first kindergarten for African-American children when she operated it from her home on 247 West 41st Street up until her death at age 74 in the year 1901. Now, her mother was a prominent woman known for penning the speech on the improvement of the mind, which 10-year-old Elizabeth delivered at a meeting of the Ladies Literary Society of New York, which was founded in 1834, and of course, which Elizabeth Jennings' mother, Elizabeth, was a founding member. And the Literary Society was founded by New York's elite black women to promote self-improvement through community activities, reading, and discussion. And this speech was produced and given in 1837. And it, the speech discusses how the neglect of cultivating the mind would keep blacks inferior to whites and would have whites and enemies believe that blacks do not have minds at all or any minds at all. So the key was to educate yourself. And Jennings believed the mind was so powerful and its improvement could help with the abolition of slavery and discrimination. They could fight the two-front war. Therefore, she called upon black women to develop their mind and then take action. 
and the importance of improving the mind was a consistent theme among elite black women in the 19th century. So by 1854, young Elizabeth had become a school teacher and a church organist, and you can see the New York African Free School to the right. She taught at the city's private African Free School, which had several locations by this time, and then later she taught in the public schools. And this gives you an idea of the streets of New York City at the time. Muddy streets, uh, the scent of horse manure, uh, and they weren't smooth streets except for cobblestones. They get rutted with the weather and the wear and mud, etc. They were filthy. So in eight, the 1850s now, the horse-drawn streetcar on rails became a more common mode of transportation, competing with the horse-drawn omnibus in New York City. Both trolley cars were pulled by horses, but the streetcar on rails, they could pull more passengers uh, with less horsepower or the same horsepower as an omnibus because it was easier for the horse to pull the cart along rails. And again, ele elevated heavy rail, the next transportation mode in the city, didn't go into service until 1869. Backing up the railroad, the first uh, locomotive was run in the late 1820s. And by the 1840s, track was being laid in certain cities across the, across the United States in the east. So like the omnibus lines, the streetcar lines were owned by private companies and their owners and drivers could refuse service to any passengers and they could also enforce segregated seating. And here's your church. So on Sunday, July 16, 1854, Elizabeth Jennings went to the first colored congregational church where she was an organist. And as she was running late, she boarded a streetcar of the 3rd Avenue Railroad Company at the corner of Pearl Street and Chatham Street. That's what it looks like today. Historical place. Now, the car didn't carry the requisite sign reading, colored people allowed in this car, but the driver pulled over to allow Jennings and her companion board. However, the conductor, again, you had the, dri the driver, and the conductor was the one who collected tickets, not the driver. The conductor who was responsible for collecting fares physically blocked Jennings from entering the car once she stepped onto the platform, and then, of course, an altercation ensued. The conflicting signals given by the driver on one hand who pulled over to let Jennings on and the conductor who stopped her from boarding show just how arbitrarily segregation was enforced at the time. And by her own account, published in the New York Tribune just a few days later, Elizabeth Jennings stated that the police officer called to the scene immediately sided with the conductor, even though she was the one that had been assaulted. And look at that picture. That's what a, a typical side street in New York would look like back in the day. Muddy, rutted, dirty, filthy. So the conductor ordered her to get off. And when she refused, the conductor tried to remove her by force. Eventually, with the aid of a police officer, Jennings was finally ejected from the streetcar, and then she was hurled onto the muddy, smelly street wearing her Sunday best clothes. And again, that's a scene of New York City. The roads weren't as smooth, though. So Horace Greeley's New York Tribune commented on the incident in, eight, in February 1855. Horace Greeley, he was the one who penned in the early 1840s, Go West, Young Man. Uh, when they were trying to uh, expand the borders of the United States and get settlers to move into the western part of the country. Quote, this is what Hor Horace Greeley said, She got up upon one of the company's cars last summer on the Sabbath to ride to church. The conductor undertook to get her off, first alleging the car was full. When that was shown to be false, he pretended the other passengers were displeased at her presence. But when she insisted on her rights, he took hold of her by force to expel her. She resisted. The conductor got her down on the platform, jammed her bonnet, soiled her dress, and injured her person. Quite a crowd gathered, but she effectually resisted. Finally, after the car had gone on further, with the aid of a policeman, they succeeded in removing her. I held my gloved hand up to the driver, and he stopped the car, as Elizabeth said. We got on the platform when the conductor told us to wait for the next car. I told him I could not wait, as I was in a hurry to go to church. He insisted upon my getting off, but I did not get off. He waited a few minutes, when the driver's driver, becoming impatient, said to me, Well, you may go in, but remember, if the passengers raise any objections, you shall go out, whether or not, or I'll put you out. 
I told him not to lay his hands on me. He took hold of me, and I took hold of the window sash and held on. He pulled me until he broke my grasp, and I took hold of his coat and held on to that, but previously he had dragged my companion out, and she was all the while screaming for him to let go of me. A crowd gathered. The driver then went to his horses. I went again into the car. The conductor said, You shall sweat for this. He then told the driver to drive as fast as he could and not to take another passenger in the car to drive until he saw an officer or a station house take her to the police station. We saw an officer at the corner of Walker and Bowery, and he, without listening to anything that I had to say, thrust me out and then pushed me down and tauntingly told me to get redress if I could. I would have come up myself, but I'm quite sore and stiff from the treatment that I received from those monsters in human form yesterday afternoon. So he heard her own words, her own account. So this incident sparked an organized movement among black New Yorkers to end racial discrimination on streetcars. They were led by notables, notables such as Elizabeth's father, Thomas, Reverend James W.C. Pennington on the right, and Reverend Henry Highland Garnett on the right, a uh, lower right. And of course, the story was publicized by Frederick Douglass in his newspaper, and it received national attention. So Jennings' father filed a lawsuit on behalf of his daughter against the driver, the conductor, and the Third Avenue Railroad Company in Brooklyn, where the Third Avenue Company was headquartered. This was one of four streetcar companies franchised in New York City, and they'd been in operation for about a year. Now, she was represented by the law firm of Culver, Parker, and Arthur. And you might recognize the guy on the right. Her case was handled by the firm's 24-year-old junior partner, Chester A. Arthur, who would become the future U.S. president, a Republican. But one thing, you've heard the term rhino. Arthur vetoed the first version of the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, which banned Chinese immigrants and essentially treated them like animals, even after they built the, the railroad. And they, then he argued that the 20-year ban on Charles, uh, Chinese immigrants of the, to the United States violated the Burlingham, Burlingame Treaty, but he signed a second version, which reduced it to a 10-year ban. Pfft. Now, in 1855, the court ruled in the favor of Elizabeth Jennings. In his car charge to the jury, Brooklyn Circuit Court Judge William Rockwell declared, colored persons, well-behaved and free from disease, had the same rights as others and could neither be ex excluded by any rules of the company nor by force or violence. That's the story that showed up in the paper. So the jury awarded Jennings damages in the amount of $250, comparable to about 12, well, with inflation, I'm going to say it's close to $15,000 today, as well as $22.50 for court costs. And the next day, the Third Avenue Railroad Company ordered its cars desegregated. She won. However, the decision didn't apply to all of the city streetcar lines, which were individually owned and operated. <clears throat> now, this was long before the unified MTA, the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, came into its existence. So each line, there were three others, they had to be challenged separately. So in an effort to avoid confrontations like the one between Elizabeth Jennings and the 3rd Avenue Lines conductor, the 6th Avenue Railroad increased the number of its cars available to African Americans beginning in October of 1854. So they just put more cars on the street that said colored passengers only. But as important as the Jennings case was, it didn't mean that all streetcar lines across the country would desegregate. Leading African-American activists formed the New York Legal Rights Association to continue the fight. This is George Thomas Downing. He passed in 1903. And in 1855, he was a well-known African-American caterer, and he made a mockery of the 6th Avenue Line segregated system by daring anybody to stop him, he was 64 at the time, from riding uptown. And he was followed by a huge band of determined supporters who pushed the car forward when the driver refused to go. And then James W.C. Pennington was arrested and convicted in 1859 for riding in a white-only streetcar operated by the 8th Avenue Railroad, and he was represented by the Legal Rights Association, which had been formed by Elizabeth's father, Thomas L. Jennings. And he challenged the system successfully, and on appeal, he gained an 1855 ruling by the state Supreme Court that such racial segregation was illegal and must end. 
And by 1865, after starts and stops, all the streetcar companies had their de de had desegregated their systems. Now, Elizabeth Jennings married Charles Graham, who only lived to be 37. He passed in 1867. He was from Long Branch, New Jersey, and they were wed in New Manhattan, New York, on June 18, 1860. They had one son, Thomas J. Graham. But unfortunately, he was a sickly child, and he died of convulsions at the age of one, and this was during the New York draft riots of July 16, 1863. Now, as the Civil War progressed, New York's anti-war politicians and newspapers kept warning its working-class white citizens, many of them were Irish or German immigrants, that emancipation, free, uh, freeing the slaves, would mean their replacement in the labor force by thousands of freed enslaved people from the South. And you can just see the fury. Arson burned half the city down. New York City's other great fire was 1776. So, facing a dire shortage of manpower in early 1863, Abraham Lincoln's government passed a strict new conscription law, which made all male citizens between the ages of 20 and 35 and all unmarried men between 35 and 45 subject to military duty and conscription to the Union Army. Though all eligible men were entered into a lottery, they could actually buy their way out of harm's way by hiring a substitute or paying $300 to the government, which roughly today is about $7,000. And if you ask me tomorrow, it's probably $7,100. <laughs> so at that time, the sum was the yearly salary for the average American worker, $300, making avoiding the draft draft impossible for all but the wealthiest of men, and compounding the issue, African Americans were exempt from the draft as they weren't even considered to be citizens. So the mobs first attacked government facilities on July 13th, and then they turned their violence on African Americans in New York City. By far the worst violence was reserved for African American men, a number of whom were lynched or beaten to death with shocking brutality. <clears throat> in all, the published death toll of the New York City draft riots was 119 people, though estimates of the actual number of people killed has reached as, fire, as high as 1,200. The 1,200 black men were lynched in New York City. Shame. So, meanwhile, Elizabeth is trying to, to get to the cemetery and to a funeral service, just as she was trying to hurry to, war, uh, to a church uh, 10 years earlier, with the, the body of her, her late son. And with the assistance of a white undertaker, the Grahams slipped through the mob-filled streets and buried their child in Cypress Hills Cemetery in Brooklyn. And the funeral service was read by Reverend Morgan Dix of the Trinity Church on Wall Street. Now, after the New York draft riots, there were numerous attacks against the African-American community in New York City. So the Grahams decided to leave Manhattan with her mother to live with their sister Matilda in Monmouth County, New Jersey, in or near the town of Eaton, New Jersey. But Charles passed in 1867 while they were in New Jersey, and Elizabeth, along with their mother and sister, moved back to New York City in the late 1860s or 1870, maybe 1869. And Graham lived her later years at 247 West 41st Street, and that's where she founded and operated the city's first kindergarten for black children in her home. And she died on June 5, 1901, at the age of 74. And according to her tombstone, she was buried in Cypress Hills Cemetery along with her one-year-old son and her husband. So in 2007, New York City co-named a block of Park Row Elizabeth Jennings Place. A great book uh, came out January 2nd, 2018. The first biography of Elizabeth Jennings written by Amy Hill Hearth, Streetcar to Justice. And it was intended for middle grade to adult readers. And the book was published by HarperCollins Green Willow in New York. And that's what New York City looked like. That's Elizabeth Jennings. Now, Rosa Parks. Quote, At the time I was arrested, I had no idea it would turn into this. It was just a day like any other day. The only thing that made it significant was the masses of the people joined in. And again, multiple sources. Famous picture. This is a drawing, actually. Who was Rosa Parks? She was a civil rights activist who refused to surrender her seat to a white passenger on a segregated bus in Montgomery, Alabama. And her defiance sparked the Montgomery bus boycott. 
Its success launched nationwide efforts to end racial segregation of all public facilities. Her bravery led to nationwide efforts to end racial segregation, and she was awarded the Martin Luther King Jr. Award by the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. She also won the Presidential Medal of Freedom and the Congressional Gold Medal, the highest honors that an American could earn from its government. I like this picture here. It's, this is just after their first meeting. It's a hot day, and it's just out in the church parking lot. There's Rosewood, of course, Martin Luther King Jr., just new to town. And they said that they had uh, the lemonade was kind of warm because of the hot day, but uh, this is where the, the, the movement was formed in um, early December 1955. So Rosa was born Rosa Louise McCauley on February 4th, 1913 in Tuskegee, Alabama. You probably heard of the Tuskegee Institute. That's where the, uh, the, uh, the red tails would fly out of the Tuskegee Airmen. And all black wing uh, that flew during World War II. They originally, it was incredible, their story. People don't know about the red tails. They flew tra and trained four different aircrafts. In three quarters of a year, they began training in a P-39. Then they switched over to a P-40. Um, then they went to a, a, a P-38 uh, Lightning and then to a P-51 Mustang. <laughs> Those are four difficult airplanes to fly. But they always you always see these depictions of the red-tailed and Mustangs, but people forget once they became competent on one airplane, they would move to another one and to another and finally to the P-51. I'm di digressing here. But her parents were James and Leona McCauley, and unfortunately they separated when Rosa was two. So her mother moved to the family to a place called Pine Level, Alabama, to live with her parents, Rose and Sylvester Edwards. Now, they were uh, descendants of slaves. Their grandparents, both of Rose's grandparents, were slaves, and they were strong advocates for racial equality. And the family lived on the Edwards farm, where Parks would spend her youth. Now, her childhood brought her early experiences with racial discrimination and activism for racial equality. In one experience, her grandfather stood in front of their house with a shotgun while Ku Klux Klan members marched down the street. And Rosa recalled going to elementary, in Pine, uh, elementary school in Pine Level, where the school buses took the white students, students to school and the black students had to walk to theirs. Quote, I'd see the bus pass by every day, but to me, that was a way of life. We had no choice but to accept what was the custom. The bus was among the first ways I realized there was a black world and a white world. So throughout Rosa's education, she attended segregated schools, and she was taught to read by her mother at a young age, and Parks attended a segregated one-room school in Pine Level, Alabama, that often lacked adequate school supplies such as desks, paper, pencil, chalk, chairs. And beginning at the age of 11, Rosa attended the city's industrial school for girls in Montgomery, Alabama, which would be burned down twice by white arsonists. But she became an excellent seamstress. And in 1929, while she was in the 11th grade and attending a laboratory school for secondary education led by the Alabama State Teachers College for Negroes, we'll uh, talk about that in a second with Joanne Robinson, Rosa left school to attend to both her sick grandmother and her mother back in Pine Level. She had to drop out of school. And she never returned to her studies. Uh, instead, she got a job at a shirt factory in Montgomery, and she married in 1932, and she would go back to school and get her high school degree in 1933 with her husband's support. She married this man at age 19 in 1932, Raymond Parks, and he was a barber and also an active member of the NAACP. But they would never have any children. Now, after graduating high school with Raymond's support, Rosa Parks became actively involved in civil rights issues by joining the Montgomery chapter of the NAACP in 1943, serving as the chapter's youth leader, as well as secretary to NAACP President E.D. Nixon, and she would hold this post until 1957. Quote, I worked on numerous cases with the NAACP, but we did not get the publicity. There were cases of flogging, peonage, murder, and rape. We didn't seem to have too many successes. It was more a matter of trying to challenge the powers that be and to let it be known that we did not wish to continue being second-class citizens. I worked on numerous cases with the NAACP, but we did not get the publicity. 
there were cases, as I said, of rape, flogging, peonage, murder, and rape. So, one day in 1943, she gets on a bus and pays the fare. She then moved to a seat, but the driver, James F. Blake, told her to follow city rules and enter the bus again from the back door. That's what they had made black people do. Pay in the front door, get off the bus, exit, and get back on in the rear door. So she did that, and it was pouring rain, and as she did that, the driver drove off, took her money. So she waited for the next bus and determined that she would never ride with Blake again. Well, you just wait. So, it's December 1st, 1955, and again, this is 12 years later, and she's arrested for refusing a bus driver's instructions to give up her seat to a white passenger. She later recalled that her refusal wasn't because she was physically tired, but that she was tired of giving in. For years, the black community had complained that the situation was unfair, she said. My resisting being mistreated on the bus did not begin with that particular arrest. It did a lot of, I did a lot of walking in Montgomery. And the bus driver on the same day was the same guy who left her in the rain in 1943, James F. Blake. So, after a long day's work at a Montgomery department store where she worked as a seamstress, Rosa Parks boarded the Cleveland Avenue bus for home. By the way, that is the bus behind me, a replica from a museum. <clears throat> She took a seat in the first of several rows that were designated for colored passengers. She wasn't breaking the law. That's the bus there. So the Montgomery City Code required that all public transportation be segregated and that bus drivers had the powers of a police officer of the city while in actual charge of any bus for the purposes of carrying out the provisions of the code. And while operating the bus, the drivers were required to provide separate but equal accommodations for white and black passengers by assigning seats. <coughs> separate but equal. They were never equal. That's Jim Crow. So, they did this. They had a line roughly in the middle of the bus that separated white passengers in the front and African-American passengers in the back. A few buses had a line right down the middle. On the left, um, African-American passengers. On the right, white passengers. So when an African-American passenger boarded the bus, again, they had to get on at the front of the bus to pay their fare and then get off and reboard the bus at the back door. Now, as the bus Rosa was riding continued on its route, it began to fill up with white passengers. Eventually, the bus was full, and the driver noticed that several white passengers were standing in the aisle. So he stopped the bus and moved the sign separating the two sections back one row, asking four black passengers to give up their seats. So he redesignated the colored section where Rosa was sitting legally and moved the chain back, making her thus illegal where she was seated. Totally unethical. The city's bus ordinance didn't specifically give drivers the authority to demand a passenger to give up a seat to anyone, regardless of color. However, Montgomery bus drivers had adopted the custom of moving back the sign separating black and white passengers, and if necessary, asking black passengers to give up their seats to white passengers. By the way, just a quick story. Um, uh, captured Nazi prisoners of war on trains, uh, African-American soldiers in the army would have to give up their seats to Nazi prisoners of wars on trains in Europe. Wild. So the first four rows of seats on each Montgomery bus were reserved for, for white people only. This, by the way, that photograph is the actual bus, Cleveland Avenue bus. So if the black passenger protested, the bus driver had the authority to refuse service and he could call the police to have them physically removed. And this is Rosa. When that white bus driver stepped back toward us and when he waved his hand and ordered us up and out of our seats, I felt a determination cover my body like a quilt on a winter night. By Park's account, Blake said, y'all better make it loud on yourselves and let me have them seats. The driver wanted us to stand up, the four of us, we didn't move at the beginning, but he says, let me have them seats. And the other three people moved, but I didn't. 
When he saw me still sitting, he asked if I was going to stand up. And I said, no, I'm not. And he said, well, if you don't stand up, I'm going to have to call the police to have you arrested. I said, you may do that. I, I would have to know for once and for all what rights I had as a human being and as a citizen. And there's her booking picture on the right. Now, Parks moved, but she uh, she moved inward towards the window seat. She didn't get up to move to the redesignated colored section. And she later said about being asked to move to the rear of the bus, I thought of Emmett Till, a 14-year-old African-American who was lynched in Mississippi a few months earlier after being accused of offending a white woman in her family's grocery store, whose killers were tried and acquitted, and I just couldn't go back. Two policemen came on the bus, and one asked me if the driver had told me to stand. He wanted to know why I didn't stand, and I told him I didn't think I should have to stand up. I asked him, why did they push us around? He said, I don't know, but the law is the law, and you are under arrest. I only knew that as I was being arrested, that it was the very last time that I would ever ride in humiliation of this kind. I did not want to be mistreated. I did not want to be deprived of a seat that I had paid for. It was just time. There was opportunity for me to take a stand to express the way I felt about being treated in that manner. I had not planned to get arrested. I had plenty to do without having to end up in jail. But when I had to for face that decision, I didn't hesitate to do so because I felt that we had endured that too long. The more we gave in, the more we complied with that kind of treatment, the more oppressive it became. So the police arrested Rosa Parks at the scene and charged her with violation of Chapter 6, Section 11 of the Montgomery City Code, and she was taken to police headquarters where later that night she was released on bail. Her arrest sparked the Montgomery bus boycott and would lead to other boycotts, sit-ins, and demonstrations, many of them led by Martin Luther King Jr., in a movement that would eventually lead to the toppling of Jim Crow laws across the South. That's a sign there. They have bus actually there. Montgomery. So members of the African American community were asked to stay off city buses on Monday, December 5th, 1955, the day of Rosa Parks' trial, in protest of her arrest. People were encouraged to stay home from work or school, take a cab, or walk to work. And with most of the African-American community not riding the bus, organizers believed a longer boycott might be successful. The Montgomery bus boycott, as it came to be known, was a huge success. It lasted for 381 days and ended with a Supreme Court ruling declaring segregation on public transit systems to be unconstitutional. E.D. Nixon began forming plans to organize a boycott of Montgomery City buses on December 1st, the very evening that Rosa Parks was arrested. There's a photo of E.D. and Rosa. So Joanne Robinson, who was a teacher at Alabama State College for Negroes, stayed up all night and she copied over 35,000 handbills by a mimeograph machine. Now, some of the, I'm, I'm old enough to remember mimeograph machines. I remember that smell. They come off quite, and the, the, it was only blueprint in the mimeograph machine, and it would bleed. So that's Joanne Robinson to the right. And they placed ads in local papers. These handbills were printed and then distributed in black neighborhoods. The Montgomery bus boycott was not a spontaneous event, however. Various organizations in Montgomery, including the NAACP, the MIA, the Montgomery Improvement Association, and the WPC had been waiting for the right moment to begin protest. So the boycott was primarily, primarily led by Joanne Gibson Robinson, and it actually began on December 3rd, two days after Rosa Parks' arrest. So Joanne Robinson was also targeted with several acts of intimidation. In fact, one local police officer threw a stone through her window, and another police officer poured acid on her car. On the day of Rosa Parks' trial, December 5, 1955, the WPC distributed the 35,000 leaflets, and this is what the handbill actually said, quote, Another woman has been arrested and thrown in jail because she refused to get up out of her seat on the bus for a white person to sit down. It is the second time since Claudette Colvin, 
Clara Colton was a teenage girl, 15, 16 years old, sassy girl. She was part of the lawsuit in, uh, for Aurelia, Aurelia Browder in the Browder versus Gale trial of 1956, but they felt she wasn't a good representative because of her age. It's the second time since the Clara Claudette Colvin case, the Negro woman has been arrested for the same thing. This has to be stopped. Negroes have rights too, for if Negroes do not ride the buses, they could not operate. Three-fourths of the riders are Negro, yet we are arrested or have to stand over empty seats. If we do not do something to stop these arrests, they will continue. The next time it may be you or your daughter or mother. This woman's case will come up on Monday. We are. Therefore, asking every Negro to stay off the buses Monday in protest of the arrest and trial. Don't ride the buses to work, to town, to school, or anywhere on Monday. You can afford just to stay out of school for one day if you have no other way to go except by bus. You can also afford to stay out of town for one day. If you work, take a cab or walk. But please, children and grown-ups, don't ride the bus at all on Monday. Please, stay off all buses Monday pretty powerful. On the morning of December 5th, the day of Rose's trial, a group of leaders from the African-American community then gathered at the Mount Zion Church in Montgomery to discuss strategies and determine that their boycott effort required a new organization and strong leadership. That photo I showed you earlier about the lemonade, where they're drinking lemonade, that's where that was taken that day at Mount Zion Church. And who'd they choose? Well, the Montgomery Improvement Association, the MIA, elected a Montgomery newcomer, Martin Luther King, as minister of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. He was new in town, and they thought he was so new that the city fathers didn't have time to intimidate him, and he wasn't afraid of anybody. So the MIA believed that Parks's case provided an excellent opportunity to take further action to, cre to create real change. And when she arrived at the courthouse for a trial that morning with her attorney, Fred Gray, to the left, she was greeted by a bustling crowd of around 500 local supporters who rooted her on. The hearing was 30 minutes. She was found guilty of violating the local ordinance and was fined $10 as well as a $4 court fee. But, inarguably, the biggest event of the day, however, is what Parks' trial had triggered. The city's buses were, by and large, empty. Some people carpooled, others rode in African-American operated cabs, but most of the estimated 52,000 African-American commuters living in the city of Montgomery at the time had opted to, work, to walk to work that day. Some had to walk as far as 20 miles. Uh, you know, the most I've ever walked in one day is 15. And it, you know, very, very tiring. So, due to the size and scope of and the loyalty to the boycott, the effort continued for several months, and the city of Montgomery had become a victorious eyesore with dozens of public buses sitting idle, ultimately severely crippling finances for its transit company. With the boycott's progress, however, came strong resistance from the whites. Some, segregational re so, some segregationists retaliated with violence. Black churches were burned, and both Martin Luther King and E.D. Nixon's homes were destroyed by bombs. Still, further attempts were made to end the boycott. The insurance was canceled for the city taxi system that was used by African Americans. Black citizens were arrested for violating an antiquated law that prohibited boycotts. They weren't doing anything. By not getting on the bus, they were getting arrested. And shortly after beginning the Montgomery bus boycott in December of 1955, black community leaders began to discuss filing a federal lawsuit to challenge the city of Montgomery and Alabama bus segregation laws. They sought a declar declaratory judgment that Alabama state statutes and ordinances of the city of Montgomery providing for and enforcing racial, seg racial segregation on privately operated buses were in violation of the 14th Amendment protections for equal treatment. So they were going to test the Constitution, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the United States con Constitution. So many African Americans took place and took legal action. 
armed with the Brown versus the Board of Education decision, which stated that separate but equal policies had no place in public education, a black legal team took the issue of segregation on public transit systems to the United States District Court for the Middle, Al Middle District of Alabama Northern, or the Montgomery Division, and Parks' attorney, Fred Gray, filed the lawsuit. So on February 1st, 1956, Fred Gray, the attorney for the Montgomery Improvement Association, he's in the upper right-hand corner, filed the lawsuit in the U.S. District Court on behalf of five black women who had been the victims of discrimination on local buses. And he was joined by Thurgood Marshall, uh, lower left, and Robert L. Carter of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, lower right. Now, the Browder versus Gale trial, 142F, uh, sub, sub, 707-1956, it took place May 11, 1956. It was filed originally listing five plaintiffs, plaintiffs Aurelia Browder on the right there, Claudette Colvin to, to her right, and then with the white graduation hat is Susie McDonald, and then that's Janetta Reese on the far right, and Mary Louise Smith was also involved. Now, Aurelia Browder was picked as the lead plaintiff because of her age. Two of the other plaintiffs were teenagers, and those two new teenagers right there were Susie McDonald and Claudette Colvin. And two others were senior citizens, but Aurelia was 37 at the time, so that put her in the middle of the other plaintiffs, and she was a good representative of all of them. Now, Jeanetta Reese, her name is always referred to in history as Jeanette. It's not. It's Jeanetta. She withdrew from the case soon after it was filed. She seems to have been intimidated by white people. She said that, uh, that uh, she was intimidated by white people, and that caused her to withdraw in February. She falsely claimed that she had not agreed to the lawsuit, which led to an unsuccessful attempt to disbar Fred Gray, the attorney representing the case, for supposedly improperly representing her. That was a lie. So William A. A. Gale on the right there, he was the mayor of Montgomery, who's the namesake defendant, Aurelia Browder, Browder versus Gale, along with Montgomery's chief of police, Montgomery's board of commissioners, representatives, Montgomery City Lines, two bus drivers, and Alabama Public Service Commission representatives. I'm not going to read the court transcripts and testimonies, but I strongly urge you to look up um, Browder versus Gale, 1956, and just read over. It's an easy read, the transcripts. It's about uh, 15 pages, but just go straight to their testimony. And you can see how the prosecutor was ask, asking leading questions, and the women held their ground, very polite, very deliberate. And uh, you, can, you can see the DA getting frustrated. On June 5th, the judges released their decision. Segregated buses violated the equal protection and due process guarantees of the 14th Amendment and were therefore declared unconstitutional. The city of Montgomery could not enforce any law which may require plaintiffs or any other Negroes similarly situated to submit to segregation and the use of bus transportation f facilities in the city of Montgomery. They won. They won their case. And you can see that photo, the famous photo of all the African Americans walking rather than taking a bus. So in June 1956, the district court declared racial segregation laws, the Jim Crow laws, as unconstitutional. And the city of Montgomery appealed the court's decision short, shortly thereafter. But on November 13, 1956, uh, just five months later, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the lower court's ruling declaring segregation on public transportation to be unconstitutional. A huge win for African Americans and minorities in America, not just in the South, not just in Montgomery. So both the city and the state appealed the decision, and on December 17, 1956, once again the Supreme Court upheld the ruling, issuing a court order to the state of Alabama to desegregate its buses. And while the Montgomery bus boycott sparked by Rosa Parks gained lasting national attention, it was Browder's court case that resulted in segregation laws being declared unconstitutional. With the transit companies and downtown businesses suffering financial loss and the legal system ruling against them, the city of Montgomery had no choice but to lift, it, lift its enforcement of segregation on public buses, and the boycott officially ended on December 20th, 1956, 381 days after it started. 
the combination of legal action backed by the unrelenting determination of the African-American community made the Montgomery bus boycott one of the largest and most successful mass movements against racial segregation in American history. Although she had become a symbol of the civil rights movement, Rosa Parks suffered hardship in the months following her arrest in Montgomery and the subsequent boy boycott. She was fired from her job in the department store, and her husband was fired after his boss forbade him to talk about his wife or their legal case. So they couldn't find work in Montgomery. They were uh, pariahs, and, and uh, they left Montgomery and went to Detroit, Michigan, along with Rosa's mother. And there, Rosa made a new life for herself, working as a sec secretary and receptionist in U.S. Representative John Conyers' congressional office. And in 1987, with her friend Elaine Easton Steele, they founded the Rosa and Raymond Parks Institute for Self-Development, and they ran a Pathways to Freedom bus tour, which introduced young people to important civil rights and underground railroad sites throughout the country. In 1992, she published her autobiography called My Story, uh, recounting her life in the segregated South. And in 1995, she published Quiet Strength, which includes her memoirs and focuses on the role that religious faith played throughout her life. Now, the band Outcast released a song uh, about Rosa Parks, and Rosa was furious uh, because she did not give her permission for them to use her name. And there were all sorts of court uh, cases against this. She filed a lawsuit against Outcast. Uh, because they used her name without her permission. Outcast said that their song was protected by the First Amendment and it didn't violate Rosa's publicity rights. And on April 14, 2005, the case was settled in favor of Outcast. But when she moved to Detroit on August 30, 1994, in central Detroit, she was 81 years old and she was assaulted by a man named Joseph Skipper who broke down our door. He claimed that he had chased away an intruder and he wanted a reward. And she... Uh, and when Parks paid to him, uh, he demanded more money, and she refused, and he attacked her and hurt her badly, and she called a friend who called the police. And a neighborhood manhunt led to Skipper's capture, but she was treated for facial injuries. And when she, what she said about the attack on her by the African-American man, she said, many gains have been made, but as you can say, see, at this time, we still have a long way to go. Skipper was sentenced to 8 to 15 years. And then the owner of Little Caesars, Mike Illich, he also owns the hockey team, the Detroit Red Wings, he decided to move her into Riverfront Towers, which was a secure high-rise apartment building, and he paid for her housing expenses for the rest of her life. On October 24, 2005, Rosa Parks died quietly in her apartment in Detroit, Michigan at the age of 92. She had been diagnosed the previous year with progressive dementia, which she had been suffering from since at least 2002. And her death was marked by several memorial services, among them lying in honor at the Capitol Rotunda in Washington, where an estimated 50,000 people viewed her casket. And she was interred between her husband and her mother at Detroit's Woodlawn Cemetery and the chapel's mausoleum, which was renamed, the chapel was renamed as the Rosa L. Parks Freedom Chapel at Woodlawn Cemetery. Now, she re received many accolades during her lifetime, including the Spingarn Medal, the NAAC's highest award, and the prestigious Martin Luther King Jr. Award. And on September 15, 1996, President Bill Clinton awarded Parks the Presidential, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is the highest honor given by the United States Executive Branch. In the following year, she was awarded the Congressional Gold Medal, which is the highest award given by the United States Legislative Branch. And in 1999, Time magazine named her as one of the 20 most influential people of the 20th century, rightfully so. And in 2000, Troy University created the Rosa Parks Museum. It's pictured there on the right at the site of her arrest in downtown Montgomery, Alabama. And the city of Grand Rapids, Michigan in 2001 consecrated Rosa Parks Circle, which is a three and a half acre park designed by Maya Lin. She was the artist and architect best known for designing the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, D.C. Angela Bassett portrayed Rosa Parks in the movie The Rosa Parks Story, released in 2002. And the movie won the 2003 NAACP Image Award, the Christopher Award, and the Black Reel Award. 
She uh, had a stamp named after her, and February 4th, 2013 would have been her 100th birthday, and that's why the post office put out a commemorative stamp. In February 2013, Barack Obama, President of the United States, unveiled a statue designed by Robert Furman and sculpted by Eugene Dobb, honoring parks in the nation's Capitol building. He remembered Parks, according to the New York Times, by saying, quote, In a single moment, with the simplest of gestures, she helped change America and change the world. And today, she takes her rightful place among those who shaped this nation's course. That's my talk for today. It's my scene. I'm John Horrigan.